gotten patents in your career. So we have some, we have some familiarity with the, with the patent system. Oh, before, and before I start, I just want to go back to Young's point about um, keeping your connections going that you make at Purdue. When I was uh, in the chemistry department getting my master's degree, um, I was great friends with um, another student who, she, her family is from um, Hawaii, and that's where she grew up. She, she was, they moved there from the Philippines when she was about two years old, so that's, you know, she went to college in Hawaii and then made it out to Purdue off of the islands for, you know, for graduate school. And now she's out here in the Northeast in working in pharmaceuticals in a, a pharmaceutical startup company um, in, near Philadelphia. So I, I like to think that I'm that persuasive that I could convince somebody who, you know, native to Hawaii to come out to the, to the Northeast and, and have a career out here. So that's, that's you know, that, that's, my, that's my take on keeping, keeping those connections. And so far I've been able to keep her, keep her from going back. But she likes it, so, so I don't mind. Um, so tonight I want to talk to you, like I said, about these um, select revisions to patent law. So what I, what I always like to start with, I mean, we have a lot of knowledge in the audience, but what I always like to start with what actually is a patent, because there can be some, um, you know, some confusion as to what it, it actually gives you. It doesn't really give you a right to do much of anything except to exclude others from doing something such as making, using, offering for sale, or selling your invention. In the US, patents are um, region specific. So you get a patent in the US, you're limited to enforcing it in the US. So we also do international patents. So you would go country by country and obtain patents wherever you think there might be a market for your product. Um, or where you think, you know, something, some infringement um, action might occur. So we can go to the next slide. Um, and so, what is this uh, America Invents Act? I mean, we hear a lot about it in the news. I hear a lot about it because I just, it's my career and I'm focused on it. It's, it's a little bit in, in popular culture. The full name is the Leahy Smith America Invents Act. We call it the AIA for short. So this was signed into law by President Obama back in September. And it's the most widespread sweeping change to patent law in, in, in a long, long time since the 1952 Patent Act. This act itself took about eight years from conception to what we see today. Um, going to be certain features are going to be enacted into law. Some some of the features are already in place. Some of the more important, bigger changes are going to be taking place in the next couple of years. It's sort of a, a triage effect because, like I said, it's it's really sweeping, and there's some goals that are behind what behind this legislation. So, can you just go back though? Because yeah. At the bottom, it just popped in. That's fine. Yep. Um, so the major goals that I've included at the bottom, reducing economic and time burdens associated with obtaining patents. I was talking to a couple of people before we started that it's very time consuming and it's to get your, to get your invention to, into a patent. So what we want to do, what, what the, the goal is with the act is to sort of streamline the process because one of the features is changing the, um, changing the current process from where the first inventor gets the patent to the first inventor to file is the one who would get a patent. So this is going to this harmonizes US law with the rest of the world. The US was the only country with a first to and, and still is they still have we still have first to invent but not for very much longer. US is the only country with this sort of regime. So what people are ending up doing is when you're going and getting your international patents and, and filing those applications, you're going to have to take different strategies in those countries versus U.S. But now, when you all have the same sort of examination structure, what you do in one country, you can typically do in the other countries. Some of it is going to be minor changes, but if for the most part, you can do the same thing over and over and over, and so you'll streamline things. Another, just I just want to touch on the point at the bottom. One more thing that it will do is minimize litigation costs. In going from first to invent to first um, to file, it makes it more um, defined. You know, when did you invent? It's a very evidentiary, heavy process to prove that you actually invented something. It's a very strict definition, and it's very record intensive. But when you com when you compare that with first to file, it's very easy. I was the first one to the patent office. I'm the I'm the one who is entitled to the patent. And so we can go to the next slide. So this is, the current, this is the current law as it stands. So first to invent, I mean, it's pretty clear. A invents before B on this timeline. B files first. A files second. So just hit it once. 
So A is the one in, under this scenario, under the first to invent scenario, is going to get the patent because they were the first one to, um, to file before B did, even though B beat them to the patent office. And for A to prove this fact, there, there could be something, it's very, like I said, it's very evidentiary, uh, heavy process. It would be called an interference, and there would be court battle back and forth for a court to decide which one of these entities actually invented first. So now under the, uh, the act, it's the first inventor to file is the one who is going to be entitled to the patent. So again, same timeline, same facts. A is going to invent, then B. B files, A files. But since it's first to file, now B is the one who is entitled to the patent. So again, it's going to be important to sort of, you know, I guess get your research done and, you know, beat that, make that race to the patent office. The, when Congress prepared this act, they didn't entirely follow the laws of other countries. Other countries have strict, um, I'm going to say strict novelty requirements for an invention to be patented. It cannot be out in the public domain whatsoever. The minute you publish a paper, for example, it's in the public domain. If you haven't filed a patent application in Europe, you can't file a patent application in Europe. Um, but Congress has provided, under the Act, this, the, these prior art, they're called prior art exceptions, prior art are journal articles, disclosures, out public knowledge, exceptions, and there's a, there's a limited grace period. So the, the protections that this is going to provide are shown here. The, you're protected from a disclosure that you make less than a year before filing. So for example, if you publish in a journal your research, within a year in the US, you have to file a patent application so that the journal article doesn't impede you from getting the patent through the US system. Then you are also protected from third party disclosures by others if you disclose your invention one year or less than one year before your application and, and, and before that third party has disclosed. So I have timelines that would make this a little bit easier to see too. So here in this scenario, this is gonna, A discloses at a certain point in March, B discloses after, B, B beats A to the patent office, but A, and so A files second. And so under this scenario, who do you think is gonna get this? A. Uh, exactly. That's very good. It's late in the day and everyone's paying attention. Great. So what they're actually calling this is sort of the poor man's provisional application. A way to sort of preserve your rights if you're not quite ready to file or just to get something quickly out there to hurry up and disclose it so that you can beat somebody else who might come to the patent office before you. However, there are problems with doing this. The term disclosure in the act is not defined, so it's unclear what a disclosure is. Could a verbal communication be a disclosure? Does it have to be in writing? How much of the invention has to be disclosed? Does it have to teach you how to actually use the invention that's in the claims or how to make the invention that you're claiming? It's very unclear, so that's a risk. So then you run into these evidentiary issues where it's not going to be clear how to prove disclosure when it comes time to rely on this um, the grace period. And the like I said, what type of disclosure you know, is, is going to be required? Your disclosure might not be identical, the disclosure that you make might not be identical to the invention that you ultimately claim, and so it would be worthless and could actually be used against you. And since foreign countries do not provide this grace period, this could actually, you know, you would lose your foreign rights to file applications on the invention by following this regime. So there are things called provisional patent applications, which a lot of times we will just file a journal article that's about to publish to get something in a patent office to preserve the inventor's right to file a year later. And then I, one last thing that I thought, since we're in the context of the university setting, this is something that's new under the Act for universities. Uh, we now have what's called micro-entity status for fees. Currently, there are two levels of fees in the patent office, large entity and small entity. Large entity fees, pretty hefty. Small people or, people or companies and universities do automatically qualify for this. But those who qualify for small entity get a 50% reduction in the cost of the fees associated with prosecuting the patent application with the patent office. 
but now the government has given universities and um, inst well institutions of higher education a further incentive to file, and they're giving um, them a 75% reduction in, in these fees. And so this is this is you know they're going to come into effect uh, next February, and the there's just going to be a requirement that the applicant or the inventor is going to have to certify that they are employed by the institution of higher education and they're obligated to assign their rights, which they, they always are typically in an employment agreement. So that shouldn't be too difficult to prove. So this is nice for, at our firm we do represent a lot of university clients, so this will be interesting to implement this and to help further, you know, further, provide further cost savings for universities who aren't going to have the deep pockets like, like the larger pharmaceutical companies or the larger corporations in general would have. So I think I have just my last, might have to hit it a couple times. Okay, and so that's, I just wanted to provide a quick overview to everyone tonight. If you have, you know, I know it's late, it's not time to, to learn new concepts <laughs> this late at night, but if you want to have any further discussions or have any further questions for me, here's my contact information. Join me on LinkedIn. Um, we have the, um, the USB, the flash drives at the back, so make sure you grab one of them, and I have business cards too, so. Um, thank you all for coming out, and it's been a, it's been a really nice evening, Young. Thank you for organizing, Young. As a, a token of our appreciation, we have a Community Support and Service Award presented to Sarah the Fox Ross Child, March 11th. You can't tell, but Sarah is also a recent mom, so you have a lot of respect juggling a new child, wow. being married, working as a successful attorney. We, we appreciate all of her support. If you have any questions regarding patent law, as you become top engineers, uh, entrepreneurs, pharmaceutical executives like Dr. Doshi we have, I hope you'll consider contacting Sarah and Fox Rothschild with any questions or concerns that you may have in the future. I remember asking one of my friends who's a mechanical engineer at Purdue, what was your favorite memory? He said, you know, working with a group of students on a senior project, it was a small tool in spinal cord regener regeneration that the engineering students, three or four, had worked with the professor on and actually had developed a patent. He said, why, why is that your favorite memory? He says, I still get a residual check from the patent oh. <laughs> and years later. It's like, all right, they, so during your time there, when, you know, whether you're a mechanical engineer or you decide to pursue uh, some other opportunities, there's a lot of cross uh, curriculum and education with other, other schools, whether it be the Entrepreneurship Center or uh, some of the uh, startup programs that they allow students and faculty to collaborate on. Hope that you'll join together in some projects, not only with, within ethics or as you graduate from, from your degree. With that in mind, again, we appreciate all your support. We have a great audience this evening, and we want to open up to question and answer for Dean Jameson, Segal, or Sarah. There's a lot of uh, students and parents here. Does anyone have any questions or concerns that they would like to ask? Can I tell about one of my favorite events? That'll be fun. May I ask your name, sir? Stanley Gusso. Stanley Gusso. Thank you, Mr. Gusso. Are there any octanarians here? Eighty. me. You're an octanarian. I'm eighty. I'm eighty-one and a half. Oh, but you might re did you go to Purdue? Oh, absolutely. Glad you may remember this then. I may. <coughs> when did you graduate? 1954. You might remember this. Okay, I don't get to train, but I want to thank I'm everybody. sure everybody has heard of Notre Dame. Yes. 1950. Purdue played Notre Dame at Notre Dame Stadium in the rain. At that time, Notre Dame was undefeated in 38 or 39 consecutive games. I think they were tied twice in that period. Purdue's football team was not noted for uh, excellence at that time. 
So I went up to Notre Dame Stadium with a couple of fraternity brothers and uh, who had a car, a Model T Ford. I think it was 1932 or 1937. I graduated in 1952. So it's in the rain, and Purdue gets a 14-0 lead in the first half. Obviously, all the Purdue students are going crazy. We're going to beat Notre Dame, the great Notre Dame. We're going to beat them. The first half ended, I think, 14 to 7. Uh, Notre Dame scoring just before the half ended. Purdue scored, I think, on the first series of downs of the third period. The rain was coming down terribly. I think at halftime, most of us went underneath the stands to escape the weather. So now we're winning 21 to 7. We finally won the game 21 to 14. And Notre Dame was threatening to, to tie the game, but uh, Purdue prevailed. So we go back to Purdue, and that Sunday, there's a uh, celebration of sorts, people running around. We are number one. If you beat the number one team, you expect to be number one. And the place was going crazy, absolutely crazy. And uh, I studied chemical engineering. Uh, that Monday morning, we're going to have a uh, uh, physical chemistry examination. You know, not just a recitation little test, but a full exam. And everybody's saying, boycott school. Do not go to school. And the professor we had for physical chemistry was uh, a good professor, very tough, threatening, you know, you better be there. That was... Not the message that was passed around, but his character gave you that message. So I and a bunch of others really did not know what to do. But we didn't go to class. Nobody went to class. On Monday morning, a parade of I don't know how many thousand, there were 14 or 15,000 students at Purdue then. And maybe all of us got into a long parade going down the main street. I forget the name of it. State Street. State Street? State Street. State Street. State Street, you know, over the bridge into Lafayette, circles, and came, came all the way back. And, you know, we are number one. And it was just a thrilling time. Uh, I can't express it to you, uh, but uh, I've tried to tell other people this story. And the only people that uh, really listened, not that you're not, <laughs> but were a couple of people I worked with who were also at that game, but unfortunately they went to Notre Dame and they did not want to hear this story. <laughs> anyway, for me that was a marvelous time. I had a great time at Purdue, absolutely great time. I threatened to go, I've been there twice since I graduated and I threatened to go back with my wife this year, but we didn't make it, maybe last year, maybe we'll make it this year. Uh, 